So now we're going to have a nosy at Mayan food. I need to put my face somewhere I'm not in the way. There we go, right at the top so you can all see me. So we didn't look at this last week, so this is something I'm including in our lesson today. So Mayan food. Now their diet mainly consisted of maize and vegetables, such as beans and squash. Now maize is what we commonly know as corn, like corn on the cob, and it can be dried and ground down to make different types of resources, almost like flour, okay, that they would make different food from. And here we've got your different ideas of squashes. So those are all like your butternut squash, you've got your pumpkins, all different types of root vegetables here that they would eat from because they're easy things to be able to grow from the ground. Now they'd also eat things like potatoes and quinoa, okay, so this is an example here of quinoa, it's a very good source of fibre, okay, these are all resources or sources that they can grow naturally, okay, that would have grown where they were. Now they also ate things like avocados and tomatoes along with fruit, we know that those are very easy things to be able to grow, especially if you've got some rich soil, they're easy for them to be able to grow and then harvest, so that's food that they can be growing and bringing in themselves without going off and shopping or having it imported from somewhere else. Now they ate something called atolling, okay, and this is a type of porridge that was made in the Mesoamerica times, okay, it's actually made from the maize, so this is where it's ground down, so rather than it being in the whole pieces of corn, it's ground down into like a fine powder, and then it's mixed and boiled with water, and it always creates like this, this texture of like a porridge, okay, and that was quite commonly eaten in those days. Now, Along with all the natural resources that they had to be able to eat, so things that they'd be able to farm, it was very easy for them to be able to hunt and gather, just like normal humans did earlier on before we hit the, the Mayan period. So wild animals were a good food supply for them, okay, and obviously all of those animals would have eaten the local resources, such as the roots, the seeds and the grasses around them, so we know they've been well fed and naturally fed. So the types of larger animals they would eat include deer and wild pig. And here you've got tapir, which almost is like, um, it's a bit like a pig, but it's almost got like a mouse snout on it. So it's a bit like a wild pig, okay? So that's going to be quite fatty uh, food that's going to keep them nice and warm in the winter times. They'd also eat things like the smaller animals. So you've got your wild turkeys and your rabbits, okay? Uh, obviously that's kind of meat that we eat nowadays as well anyway. They would tend to eat monkeys, okay, because don't forget they lived in the rainforest, that would have been an animal that would have been around. They'd eat iguanas, okay, now iguana would have quite tough meat on it because a lot of it would be muscular because of the scales, okay. But then they would eat something called uh, coati, okay, which is a bit like a raccoon, which obviously are very common wild animals. Again, quite fatty and quite meaty. Now, animals were also hunted, not just for their food, but for their fur. And we saw in one of the photos, looking at the priest and the king, they had very beautiful clothing on that looked like it had um, jaguar print or leopard print on it. So they would actually hunt jaguars, pumas, and an ocelot. An ocelot's almost like a smaller version of a jaguar. So again, it's got that very patterned skin, uh, that very patterned fur. But rather than eating them, they'd actually hunt them for the fur and they'd be worn as decoration mostly by people of high, higher society, so higher status in society. Now, obviously, one of the common things that they can do very easily, okay, is to farm. Okay, when they settle into that village life, a lot of the civilizations and cities came afterwards. And obviously, because the society expanded and got bigger, they needed to be able to provide resources for all of those people. So they needed a reliable food supply. So obviously, they had to then grow it themselves. So they almost had to, you know, regenerate that turnover of food and supply to be able to feed all the people as their civilization was growing. So farmers in the rainforest cleared the land using a measure called slash and burn. So obviously, they needed the space to be able to dig out the fields to grow their crops. So this is where the vines and the trees would be chopped and cleared, so they'd axe them down, and anything that was then left behind, they would then burn, okay, and anything that then burn, obviously, would then turn to ash, which can be quite fertile, to be able to grow things in the soil. So the seeds were then planted in that ash to create that fertile land, and then be able to grow crops. Now, that soil would only be fertile for a few years, okay, so at that point in time, once that land's become useless, it would have to be left to lie fallow, and fallow means to leave it alone, okay, so it needs a few seasons for itself to be able to regenerate itself, and what would happen is you'd start to see new forest growth, so those trees that originally cut down would start to grow through again, and obviously they then would repeat that process again, where they'd slash anything down that grows through, and then they'd burn it again, re-fertilise the soil, grow new crops, 
and they had to go through that process of cutting down regrowing the rainforest to be able to regenerate their food supplies in their soil now while some of that land was then left fallow so left to to, to rest on its own before it regrew obviously they would have to clear and plant elsewhere okay so once one piece of land was left fallow on its own they'd have to repeat the slash and burn process somewhere else so that as the seasons went through once one no longer became available they'd be able to move on to the next one which means they'd have like a constant flow and they'd alternate between the different plots of land meaning they generate that whole year round supply of food okay now it is still used as a method in some countries but obviously for a lot of us we see that as deforestation which has monumental effects on habitats ecosystems and everything else that's that happens within our planet but that was a common thing for them to use in those days to be able to generate that amount of food for such a growing society now their meal times were interesting okay so they would only usually eat twice a day okay something miss humphrey doesn't do i <laughs> i mean i probably eat more than twice a day which i probably shouldn't um now their main meal would be around midday and then they'd snack in the evening okay now their diet was very simple but it was a very healthy diet obviously they don't have things like well i'm gonna say chocolate but i'm gonna come on to that in a minute they wouldn't have things that would have all the saturated and monosaturated fats that we have in our food nowadays so obviously a lot of our food is processed and we add so much more additional fat and oils and things that aren't good for our body but they had a very healthy diet based on the maize they had the beans and all of those fruit and vegetables because they're all things they can naturally source themselves now the food was then cooked and served in bowls made from pottery so okay they hadn't they hadn't been able to work out metal at that point in time so we have cooking pots nowadays but they would use their clay pottery which could be heated to a very high temperature and therefore would then cook the food okay now i said they don't need chocolate <laughs> i lied i lied so one of the biggest things that came out of the mine and aztec civilization okay was that they actually had what's called cacao beans okay um, and they used the cacao beans to make a drink that was available only to the very rich and important people okay now cacao beans is what we can use nowadays along with cocoa beans to make chocolate now cacao beans are very bitter in comparison to cocoa beans and depending on the way that they're burnt cooked and then crushed down will give you a more bitter taste to the chocolate so it's more raw chocolate because it doesn't have as much of the sweetness that comes from cocoa beans okay so there's a difference between cocoa and cacao beans okay but that for them was chocolate okay and they effectively generated this idea that's that's come from civilization since that we have nowadays as being modern day chocolate okay now their cacao bean drink that they'd make it's almost like a hot chocolate okay was very bitter like i said it doesn't have that sweetness to it so what they do is they'd actually spice it with chili pepper now i'm going to give you guys an extra challenge to do at the end of this lesson and we'll see if how many of you do it i might try it myself um and i'll maybe let you know what i think of it but i mean i don't do spice but i might i might give this one a go now cacao trees were very rare okay and we know from lots of things we're looking at in reading when things are rare okay the more rare something is the more expensive it is the higher value it has because it's limited because there's not a lot of it okay so the beans actually became very very valuable and they became a source of being able to export it to different countries and civilizations okay for more money now in those days they didn't have money money wasn't a thing so the valuable the more valuable they were okay the more that they were able to be exchanged okay so they were actually used as a type of currency so they might have wanted somebody's pig okay from a from a neighboring town and they might say well actually i'll have your pig and if i can have your pig i'll give you 10 cacao beans okay and these these beans would be used in place of money because they were very valuable and you could do a lot of things with them so on that note you have two challenges to do now i know which one you're all probably going to go and make and you're all probably going to go and make it your own way now i had did have a hot chocolate earlier because i went for a walk but i definitely did not put spiced pepper into it so we'll see if i can attempt to make a mayan hot chocolate but the first activity i want you to do first because we didn't include this in our last lesson is I want to find a picture of your food item and i want you to draw it in the middle so pick some of the food from mayan the mayan food that we've looked at it could be anything you can go and do your own research and find something else chocolate to be fair might be a good one uh, to use because it expands over many centuries of how it's been used and i want you to see how many different interesting facts you can find out about your food item 
Where can you find them today? And how might they be used in cooking? And in which countries are they popular? So chocolate probably is a very good one. Corn would be a good one. Maize. Okay, because that still comes across in lots of different food that we have nowadays. I want you to draw the picture in the middle and label it. And I want you to see how many interesting facts you can find. Now, I know it says six boxes, but that doesn't mean you just write one thing in each box. You can add multiple things into each of these boxes. So please make sure you do it with detail. Once you've done that, you can then have a go at making your own mine hot chocolate if you so wish. Okay, you don't have to. So you can have any instant hot chocolate powder. Okay, anything at all makes no difference. 250 ml of milk. Now, I think that's going to make more than one cup. Okay, so what I suggest you do is I would boil almost like a cup and a half worth of milk or two cups, and then you can share it with somebody else. And you're going to add a teaspoon of ground cinnamon. Ugh, you know, Miss Humphrey doesn't like cinnamon when you sprinkled it all over my classroom. And a pinch of chilli powder. And it follows the instruction series of how to make your own ancient Mayan hot chocolate. So if you do have a go at doing that one as well, by all means, take some pictures of it and show them to me. And let me know what you think of the taste of the Mayan hot chocolate. I mean, I already know that the cinnamon's going to put me off. And actually, for somebody who doesn't like spice, I think I'd prefer the chilli powder than the ground cinnamon. Uh, I just, mm, no, no, no. Mm. Cin cinnamon is... It's not, it's not my favourite, okay? Now, there is a top tip here for you to be able to make it even more um, authentic, and that's using cacao chocolate, so dark chocolate, because that's got a more bitter taste to it. The normal hot chocolate we, we use is more sweetened, okay, because it's milk chocolate powder. And it says here, if you pour it back and forth between mugs, okay, or even from jugs, or even using a whisk as you're cooking it on the hob or you're mixing it, like it will give you that nice froth that goes on top as well, okay? So, have a go at finding out what the Maya eat. Think of a piece of food, okay? I suggest maybe going for chocolate or maize, okay? Because they're the two biggest things that are still very popular today. See how much amazing information you can find. And then if you think, that oh, you've just done too much hard work, you need a hot chocolate to just chill out from, have a go at making yourself an ancient Maya hot chocolate and let me know what you think of the taste of it, Okay? So, have a go at doing the work. Send me in some pictures of your work on Wednesday and send me in any pictures of your hot chocolate that you do as well. And then we will continue with this topic into next half term. Okay? Good luck, you five.